Good morning. It's nice to see all your smiling faces here. Would you stand with us as we go to before the Lord? Heavenly Father, I just want to praise you and thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Be, be with us as we come to you and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
this time, I'd like to dismiss the children for Children's Church and take a few moments and greet each other. Okay, so you're returning to your seats. Just a few announcements. Actually, I don't really have any announcements today. It's really unusual. But I definitely wanted to welcome you to church and glad you're here with us this morning. Welcome the people online who are watching at home or wherever they may be traveling on their phones or something. We're glad you're here. And if you're new or maybe you're visiting, we have the connection card there in the front of the seats. Make sure you grab one and fill that out so that we know that you're here. We just want to be able to, to know that you came to worship with us today. And also, if you have any prayer requests, throw those on there. You know, that's what we, we look for. You know, Pastor Ray and I and can pray for those things. So uh, make sure that you take full advantage of that, okay? Don't, don't leave those there. We'd rather replace them every week and get them used up so we can be praying for the different things that are going on. And then if we have somebody that's new, please put your name down so we can know that you came and visit with us and we can reach out to you. So with that, I'm going to call the men forward for the morning offering today. And I'm going to ask Ben Rude to bless the offering today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of our tithes and offerings to you as a uh, gesture of the blessings you bestowed on us. Amen.
Thank you, Sharon, as always, that was lovely. I'm not going to, I'm going to avoid all controversy this week, so I won't mention any of the college football games from yesterday. <laughs> Would you all please stand for our doxology and the hymns to follow, please. First hymn this morning is How Firm a Foundation, verses 1 and 2. And our second verse, or second hymn is The Solid Rock, verses one and four. Thank you for that beautiful singing. Please be seated. Good job. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. Welcome to uh, the visitors. Any visitors that are here today, so glad that you're here. And hopefully I'd love to meet you at the end of the service. And um, good day. Beautiful day outside, isn't it? Good day to be in God's house. Hey, uh, just uh, one announcement. Michelle wanted me to mention, uh, ladies, just a reminder, the fall, the ladies fall meet up with the country colors that next Sunday is the deadline to RSVP and get your payment in. Uh, it's going to be a fun afternoon, custom painting theme to go along with a devotional as well. So don't forget to bring a, also a fall finger food to share. If you have any questions, you can contact the office or Michelle. And so that's coming up in a couple weeks. So I'd like for you to turn to Romans 5, and I think we're going to conclude the series today, and we've got a new series next week that it, the Lord's put on our hearts, but Romans 5, and I can shut that off, I'm going to take a, all right. 
So Romans 5, we've been going through for, for the last couple of months, we've been studying the gospel. What is the gospel? We talked about the doctrines of the gospel. And then for the last few weeks in Romans 5, we've been going systematically through the first few verses of Romans 5 because Paul gives us benefits, blessings of the gospel. We've seen uh, the peace of God, Romans 5. We have peace with God. We have the peace of God. We've seen in verse 2, hope. The hope we rejoice with the hope, with the hope. Last week was the assurance of God's love, verse 5. It says that God's love has been poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit. And so um, today's been, if you just go right in line, you just go right in line, Romans 5, 9. Today's benefits not necessarily about what we receive, but it's about what we've been saved from. And we can see it on the screen. <laughs> Saved from wrath. Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. <clears throat> so the blessing here <laughs> is that we're saved from the wrath of God. That's a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't you glad... We sang about my hope is building on nothing less than Jesus' blood. Aren't you glad if you've received Jesus that you're saved, that you're saved from the wrath of God? More specifically, the wrath of God that's referring to, it's we're saved from hell. We're saved from everlasting uh, torture and punishment. You know, when you commit yourself to preaching the Bible as it is written, when you commit yourself to preaching systematically through theology, a school they call that expositional preaching, where you don't just pick and choose the parts of, parts of the Scripture you want. You, when you go through the Bible and you preach the Bible as it is, you're going to come across parts of the Bible that are uncomfortable. You're going to come across parts of the Bible that uh, don't make you feel good. You really don't like. I mean, there's some parts of the Bible, you know, it's, that aren't fun to preach. It's not fun to preach. But you have to, if you commit yourself to preaching God's Word, you have to preach all the Bible, amen? You can't just preach the, just parts of it. And so today, we're preaching, we, you know, it's, it's fun to preach on peace, hope, and love, but today I'm going to preach a message on the, what we've been saved from. We've been saved from wrath. We've been saved from wrath. Specifically, we have been saved as believers from hell. When you understand what you've been saved from, when you understand that as a Christian you've been saved from hell, that's what makes the gospel so much more precious. So what does the Bible say about hell? Specifically, what does Jesus say about hell? Did you know Jesus spoke of hell more than any other person in the Bible? He actually spoke of hell more than he spoke of heaven. Because he came to save. He came to rescue. Now to begin, and that's going to be our study today, we're going to give you some points of what Jesus said, some descriptions about hell. Uh, to begin, there's, there's two different names of hell in the Gospels that Jesus uses. Two different names. We're going to look at them today. The first, and you've got your notes there, and, and I hope you take notes on this. The first name that Jesus uses, it's the word Hades. The Greek word Hades, the second word that he uses is the word Gehenna. We'll see, and they're, they're, they're the same. We'll see that they're the same and that they both refer to being in a place of hell. But they're different in that one is referring to the hell that the lost go to when they die. The other is referring to the, the final place, the hell of the final place of judgment. And so we'll, we'll be able to discern those this morning. So Luke 16, that's where I'm going to start. Luke 16, Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a poor man. And in Luke 16, verse 22, it says, The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Other translations say to Abraham's bosom or to paradise. You could say to paradise, uh, to heaven. Uh, the rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23 says, And in Hades, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So we see here that the rich man, he dies, and he goes to Hades. 
Hades literally means the place of the dead. So, Hades that Jesus is referring here to, it's, it's the hell that the spirits of the unbelievers, the spirits of the unsaved go to when they die. You know, this refutes a couple things. This scripture right here that Jesus, it refutes a couple teachings that some churches teach. Number one, it refutes the idea of soul sleep that is taught in some churches. That you just, you just go to sleep. You know, rest in peace. No, you don't go to sleep when you die. There's no soul sleep after death. Notice Jesus says, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. He's alert. You see that? He's alert. He's awake. He's not sleeping. The other teaching that this refutes is the teaching of purgatory. Purgatory is the teaching. It's like a temporary holding place that if you die, you go to this little holding place uh, where you get, you, get, you get the opportunity to get a second chance, to get purified, to get right, and then God will allow us into heaven. No, on the contrary, Jesus clearly shows us that when we die, we lift up our eyes in one of two places. In heaven, paradise, where Lazarus lifted up his eyes, where he uh, was awakened to, or in hell or Hades. So, seven quick descriptions that I'm going to give you from what Jesus said. This is what Jesus said about hell. We're going to go through really quickly. Number one, from this scripture, notice hell is a place of torment. Did you catch that? That the, in Hades, being in torment torment. The rich man lifted up his eyes. Excru he was in excruciating pain. There's no relief in sight. One moment, this rich man, he's, he's enjoying his wealth. He's living the good life. He's partying it up. He's, he's, he's living it up. He's living the dream. He's got the designer clothes. He's got the, the big house. He's got the servants and the spas. It's, it's a life of ease. It's easy living. But the moment that he died, he left it all behind. And that life of ease on earth turned to torment when he died. Look at verse 24. This rich man, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Number two, hell is a place of fire. Notice he said it's flame. It's, it's, it's a place of flame. He's engulfed in flames. He's in anguish. There's no fire extinguishers. There's no water. There's, there's no fire department. He's screaming for, just give me one, one little drop of water. That, that's all, just one little drop of water, but he can't get it. You know, one of, the, one of the sad things about being a pastor and performing funerals, and Pastor Scott and I have, have we've had this conversation, he, he already knows where I'm going, is when you're doing the funeral for someone that you know has rejected Jesus. Man, that's a, that's a sad funeral right there. But so often the family or friends come, they don't, they don't really know what's going on. And, you know, you'll hear them, they'll come up and they'll say their eulogies and may he rest in peace, rest easy. That's a rest easy, brother. But as a pastor, your heart is breaking because you know he's not resting in peace. He's not resting in peace if he rejected Jesus. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of, of fire. Look at verse 25, but Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in anguish. And besides all this, now look at this, between us and you, a great chasm, a divide, has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Number three, this lets us know that hell is a place of no escape. There's no, there's no getting out. Once you're there, you're there. You know, in the church we have, see the exit doors? We have emergency exit doors. If there's an emergency, if there's a fire, you can go out that door, that door, the, the back door. You can go through the floor. There's doors everywhere. There's escape doors everywhere. But in hell, there is no escape. There is no way getting out. Once you're there, you're there. 
You're there because there's a divide that, that is separating the, the outside world from hell. You know, this also, here's another teaching that this refutes. It refutes the idea that the spirits of the loved ones roam around the earth after they die. Bible says it's one or two places. It's one or two places the moment you die. Your, your loved ones, your ancestors don't come back and visit you at the bedside. And they, they, they don't. In hell, in Hades, or in paradise, they lifted up their eyes. Look at verse 27. And, and then he said, then I beg you. This is the rich man. He's still talking. I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. Send them to my loved ones. That's what he's saying. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Do you see here? Number four, this is a place, it's a place of remorse. Notice the remorse. Do you see the remorse and regret? The rich man didn't say, hey, I'm having a party down here. Tell my brothers, I'm going to save my space. We're going to party. It's go, we're going to live it up. We're going to sell it. No, he, he said, warn my brothers. Warn my family about this place of torment. Tell them about Jesus. See, people who go to this terrible place, the, the second they arrive, they're in remorse. They're in regret. All of a sudden, they're concerned for the lost. They're concerned for the lost. They, they're, it's a continual state of regret. They're thinking, they're thinking about the times that they've heard the gospel, like today, but yet they've rejected Jesus. They're thinking about all the times they, they sat in church and they heard messages like this right here, and they rejected Jesus. They're even probably thinking of time. Well, I gave money to the church. I tithed. I helped the poor. But I rejected Jesus. They're, 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 why did I spend my whole life just, just so focused only on earthly things, just focused on just the here and now? They're, they're in this, this perpetual state of regret. They're thinking, I had every opportunity to receive Jesus, but nothing can be done now. Because in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. But you know, as bad as Hades, hell is, that's not the final destination. Actually, you, it's just, actually just a holding place. Remember, Hades is the place of the dead. Because now this is something that a, a lot of people fail to, to teach on. But there's actually a future judgment that's coming beyond Hades, that's even worse. According to Revelation, after the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus will return to earth to establish his millennial reign, that 1,000-year reign in Jerusalem. But then after the 1,000-year reign will come the final judgment. And I'm going to show you this from Revelation 20, verse 11. Revelation 20, 11 says this, and you can write this down in your notes. It says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence. Earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. Now let's just skip down to verse 13. Go to verse 13. We'll skip past verse 12. It says, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead. In other words, those who were in Hades hell. I don't know how it's going to happen, but somehow they're going to be lifted up out of that place. And it says they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So they're going to be lifted out of that awful place, and they're going to stand before the great white throne. Now, let me tell you this. This judgment, the great white throne judgment, is for the unsaved. It's for those who have rejected Jesus. It's not for the Christians. It's not for the believers. Believers will stand before the judgment, the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to get their rewards for what they've done on earth. But here, the great white throne judgment, those who have rejected Jesus, they're not going to receive a reward. They're going to receive their final judgment. They're not there. 
like they're standing before a judge on sentencing day, hoping to get their sentence commuted, hoping to get a pardoned. They've already been judged. They've already rejected Jesus. The opportunity to receive Jesus is while we're here on earth. <laughs> They've rejected Jesus. They've had every opportunity on earth. They're there to receive the final judgment. But look at verse 14. It says, Then death and Hades, remember Hades, the place of the dead, hell, is thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Notice it says Hades will be thrown, will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the other place that Jesus taught about in regards to hell. This is Gehenna. I'm going to show you some scriptures. This is Gehenna hell. This is the final destination, final lake of fire. For example, Mark 9, verse 47. This is Jesus' reference to the lake of fire, to Gehenna. Mark 9, 47, Jesus said, It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. The word, you can look this up, that Jesus, is, that Jesus uses here, it's the word Gehenna, which is the word, which is the lake of fire from Revelation chapter 20, the final hell, the final destination. Also, I want you to notice here, notice Jesus says, to be thrown into hell. Did you notice Revelation 20, 15 says, was thrown into the lake of fire. Here's the difference. Hades... You die, you lift up your eyes. Gehenna, lake of fire, hell, throne. Was thrown. Do you see the difference? Anytime, anytime you see from Jesus cast or thrown into hell, he's referring to this final judgment, the, the final lake of fire, final Gehenna. So the difference, and I think it's important that you know the difference. There are two places of hell. Now it's all hell. But there's two distinct places. So let's look how Jesus describes Gehenna Hill. Mark 9, 48. We looked at 47. We know that the context, he's referring to Gehenna. He says it was thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now there's another teaching that some churches teach. That the death of Revelation 20, 14, the second death, it's annihilation. That the moment that they're cast into this lake of fire, Gehenna, they're annihilated. But that's incorrect according to Jesus. Notice Jesus said in this final Gehenna, the worm doesn't even die. Little worm. Worm doesn't even die. He also speaks of Gehenna Hill, Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, referring to Gehenna. So notice, eternal fire. And the worm doesn't die. Here's what that means. It means that it's an eternal state of consciousness, eternal state of torment. Here's point number five. Hell is a place... That's eternal. This final judgment, it's eternal. Forever and ever and ever. We sing about heaven. We teach about heaven that is forever and ever and ever. And oh, that's going to be a wonderful day when we get to heaven. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, what about the unbeliever? It's eternity forever and ever in the lake of fire. Matthew 25, verse 30, in that same teaching, speaking of hell, he says, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. Notice, he was cast. So what's this referring to? Gehenna, lake of fire, right? He was cast into hell. And then Jesus said, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So number six, outer darkness. 
It's a place of darkness. It's a place of darkness. I remember torn caverns and Michelle and I toured a Lin Linville Caverns of North Carolina mountains. And I know there's caverns around here. I look to tour, but, but you know, they do it at all of, they take you into the depths of those caverns and what do they do? They turn out the light. There's no, it's a complete absence of light. It's so dark, you can, it's like you can feel it. It's just a creepy feeling, isn't it, when you're in absolute darkness. You can't even, you can't even see your, your hand in front of your place, in, in front of your face. Hell is not only eternal, but it's complete darkness. Why is it darkness? Jesus isn't there. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light of the world. So if, so if Jesus is absent, then light is absent. You know, people joke and say, I'll see my friends in hell. You won't even see your hand in front of your face. It's complete absence, complete absence of darkness. It's eternal darkness. Then he says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, in the old days, you watch these movies if they're, say, like the days of the Wild West and they were doing an amputation or they were doing emergency surgery. They liquor you up and they throw a cloth in the mouth, right? So you can gnash your teeth while you're enduring the pain. See, that's the gnashing of teeth. Imagine that for eternity. Which leads to my last point. Matthew 25, verse 41 Again, Jesus said, depart from me, or he says, be separated from me. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, 9, Paul is referring to Gehenna, hell. It says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Here's my last point. Number seven, place. Hell is a place of eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God. Right now, even the lost aren't absent from God. God's still present in the earth. His spirit is hovering in, in the earth. Even the unsaved can sense his love, God's love and, and God's peace because of God's presence in the earth. So even though they're rejecting God, his presence is still here. His presence is still surrounding them. If you leave this place today rejecting God, God's presence is still here. But imagine a complete separation from God. Perhaps that's the worst hell of all. God is. I got chills. God is nowhere to be found. He's, he's absent. He's, he's separated. I heard the story of a dying father, and his four kids were around his bedside as he was dying. So he said to each of his four children, he said, Good night, John. Good night, Tim. Good night, Betty. Goodbye, Ralph. Ralph said, wait a minute. You said good night to my siblings, but you said goodbye to me. The father told Ralph, because the others have accepted Jesus, I'll see them again in heaven. But because you rejected Jesus, I'll never see you again. But here's the good news for those that are here today, for those that will be listening online, watching online, it doesn't have to be goodbye for you. That doesn't have to be your story. You don't have to go to hell. For in this gospel we are saved from the wrath when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity today. You have the opportunity today to receive Jesus as your Savior, to put all your trust in Him, to put your hope in Him. You can be saved from this wrath.
2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, It's not God's will that any perish, but that all come to repentance. I want you to know that God has given you a way to escape this terrible place. He gave us Jesus who went to the cross who took the hell that we deserved, who, who took the wrath of God on himself to save us. You can trust Jesus today. Let me just remind you, too, because people ask the question, how can a loving God send someone to hell? Let me tell you, God has never sent anyone to hell. He sent his son Jesus to rescue you, to save you. You just said it, brother. We send ourselves. We send ourselves by rejecting Jesus. As a matter of fact, did you, did you notice in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, hell was prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. <laughs> this final hell, that's the place where, where the devil and his angels are, are going to be sent to. So we have a choice. We have a choice. We determine where we spend eternity. For the Christian, for the Christian that's listening, you know, messages like this, they're meant to stir us up. They're meant to invoke a response. Number one, when I, when I read this, man, I just can't help but fall in love with Jesus and thank Jesus for what he's done. Man, yeah, I, I just can't help. When I was reading these verses this week, th this week and I just couldn't help but, God, I want to live my life for you. God, I, I, God, forgive me for focusing on stupid stuff that doesn't even matter. God, I commit myself to you. And, and number two, here's the next thing. Messages like this are meant to stir us up to tell others about Jesus. To tell our family about Jesus. To tell our friends about Jesus. Maybe you've said this before. Maybe you've said, well, I don't want to offend people. I don't want them to get mad at me. I don't want to push them away. You know, I've, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of people say, here's a big one, my faith is private. My faith is private. Let me tell you something. A private faith is a disobedient faith. Jesus never talks about a private faith. Nowhere in the Bible do, do, or is anything said about having a private faith. If anything, we're to be bold. Acts 1.8, we're to be filled with the Spirit. We're to go and tell and, and witness and be a witness to others. We're to be open about our faith. One last verse I'm leaving you with. Jude 1.23. Check this verse out. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Because when you're telling others about Jesus, that's what you're doing. If your child was in a house that was on fire and he or she was inside sleeping and didn't know about the fire, would you just let him burn in the fire? Well, I don't want to wake him up. He gets grumpy when he wakes up. I don't want to have to deal with him when he gets up. I don't want him to get mad at me. Or maybe you're like, well, I'm not EMS trained. I'm not, you know, trained. I'm not a trained firefighter. I'll just wait until the fire truck arrives to put out the fire, and then I'll go in and get him. No parent is going to be like that. You're going to bust through those doors, aren't you? You don't care if that kid says, you're going to wake up, wake up, and you're going to grab, you're going to grab that kid, and you're going you're gonna to rescue that child. We got to get out of here. I don't care if he, if he cries and gets mad or offended. I'm, I'm saving him from the fire. And as believers, we can't be content with watching the house burn while friends and family and passerbys are, are on the inside. We got to snatch them. We got to snatch them out of the fire. Maybe you're like, well, I want to share. I want to tell people. I want to tell others about Jesus, but I don't know what to say. Start by sharing your testimony. Start by telling what Jesus has done for you. Learn how to share the gospel. There's something for you. Learn. Learn how to share the gospel. 
And to make it even more simple for you, as I close, we've made it easy. Pastor Scott made these salvation cards right here. English on the front, Spanish on the back, ABCs of salvation. We've got hundreds of them that Jerry printed out on the foyer. We got them on the table. There's stacks of them. Walk, walk, grab, grab all of them. Take all of them. And here you go. ABCs of salvation right here for those lost loved ones, those friends, those you come in contact with people in town, you can give them this little card right here. and It'll tell them how to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. As I close, if you're a Christian, if you're grateful to be safe from this place, let's love Jesus more. Let's commit ourselves to Him. Let's live for Him. Let's give our lives for Him. Let's ask Him, God, fill me with Your Spirit. That's what the Bible says in Acts 1-8, that when the Spirit comes by, you'll be a bold witness. God, fill me with Your Spirit so that I can be empowered to share the gospel. Do you know that ultimately the mission and the purpose of the church is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is the mission that God has called us to, to tell others about Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and give me just a couple minutes. Christians, give me just a couple minutes because I want to talk to those today who don't know that they know that they know that they know that Jesus is their Savior. Why do I always give the gospel at the end of every message? Why do I always give an invitation? Because this might be the last sermon I ever preach. This might be the last time you ever hear a sermon about Jesus. Right where you're seated, right where you're at, if this, if this gets shared online, you can receive Jesus right now. You can receive Jesus and you can be saved and you can go to heaven and spend eternity with, with Jesus forever. You don't have to go to this place. You have the opportunity today. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. If you believe that Jesus took your place on the cross, that he shed his blood on the cross, that, that you can't save yourself, if you believe that, that gospel, you can be saved today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and this is not just say a little prayer and, and magic happens. No, this is just a template for you to pray from your heart to receive Jesus today, would you pray with me? Say, Jesus, I know you went to the cross for me. Jesus, I know that you shed your blood for me. I know that I can't save myself. I know that there's, no, there's nothing good in me, in my own ability, but I put all my trust in you. Pray that right now. I put all my trust in you. I trust in what you have done for me. I ask you to save me. God's looking at your heart. God, save me. God, save me. God, forgive me of my sin. I trust in you. If you pray that from, from your heart and you mean it from the depths of your soul, the Bible says you shall be born again. I'd love at the end of the service, come and see me. Come and talk to me. I'd love to, to talk with you. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would, that you would stir our hearts. Lord, that you would save the lost. And, and for the believers, help us to, God, I pray that you would give us a burden, Father. That you would give us a burden to reach people for, for Jesus. That you would, Lord, put us on mission. Put us on purpose. Help us to focus on the main thing. God, and we believe, Lord, that you have spoken today. We believe, God, that your spirit is present today. And I pray that we would receive this, that we would respond to you, and that we would leave changed. Thank you, Father, for saving us from this terrible place by sending Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lead us. Go ahead and stand with us as we close in our worship service.
prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to praise you and thank you for the message today. Just thank you for um, sending your son to rescue us. Just ask that you be with us this week as we go about our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.